He I mean, can't trust the stew. Who knows? As People are getting weird with names. Speaking of getting names, naming oh. a baby is fucking hard. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know that Stu's on our list. No offense, Stu. It's a great name, but it's hard, you know? It's like well, his real name's Stu Word. Okay, Stu oh, Word, okay. going okay. for Stu. So, okay. yeah. That makes sense. Anyways, a lot of pressure. People are getting weird with names out there these yeah. days. But <laughs> Stu, you got a great name. What does, what does Stu have to say? Yeah. <laughs> Stu's question is Hey, Beardsman. We started this show be Bether and Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy how loyal you guys were is thirsty for some One group. of the encouraging men to be the best version. Ask us anything. Welcome to the Beardsman. Spirits, man. That is a good question. You know, you got 14 hours, let's say. A little bit burnt out, unmotivated. Week, not their birthday. Uh, I gotta extend it. Welcome to the Beards Men. I am here with the Beards Men. <laughs> A.K.A. Spencer and Anthony. A.K.A. the founders of Live Bearded. A.K.A. Millennials. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have any others that what you'd else? like to go Keep with? Keep it going. A.K.A. Uh, the real estate broker and the basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let back. you decide which one you think is what. <laughs> What's up, guys? My name is Spence. I'm Anthony. A.K.A. the tan and the pale. <laughs> there we go. Oh, I had another one. Had another one. Oh. And as JR said, I've, I've never had that many A.K.A.'s before. Wow, quite but the intro. I guess we are the crazy mofos that started Live Bearded. And we started this podcast because as our... Uh, the, honestly, the, our favorite thing to do here as the owners of Live Bearded over the last seven years we've been doing this is talking to our customers. Guys come into the office every day. We love chopping it up, hearing their stories. A guy came by yesterday, Bradley Ivers. Yeah, amazing. Shout out to you if you hear this, brother. Thanks for coming he by, He literally bro. was one of our first customers in 2016. He brought his wife in for their five-year anniversary. He's out here from West Virginia. Like being able to meet those guys and connect with those people, the customers of ours over the years has been so special. Been the favorite part yeah. that I have. And so we started this show to carry the conversation out to everyone that can't maybe come in and meet us in person or that we don't have an opportunity to connect with. So this is a show to answer your questions and really talk about the experience of being a man in the world today. Yeah, guys, we're passionate about a lot of things. But one of the biggest things we're passionate about is encouraging men to be the best versions of themselves. Oh. That's why we put this podcast together. I thought you were going to say beards. Well, for a <laughs> well that's, that's, that's important. Part of being a good man yeah. is, having, is a, having a great beard. And we beard. can help you with that, too. Yeah. And having less of a beard doesn't make you less of a man. And not having one. Just might. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. The format of this podcast is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. It's an ask us anything. Literally, there's nothing that we won't talk about, whether it's personal development, mindset, business, Family, fitness, health, sex, wellness. drugs, and rock and roll. Literally, ask a question, and we're going to give you our <laughs> yeah. our opinion about it. Yeah, yeah. They have Pokemon, questions. Hello Kitty. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We might not know anything about these categories, <laughs> yeah. but we'll talk about. What it. is Pokemon? Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If they want to ask us questions, you can submit your questions by emailing us at ask at livebearded.com, or you can comment your questions in the video below if you're watching on YouTube. Yeah. There so don't hold back. And as Jr. said. We'll talk, mock, but not walk away from the question. How are you guys doing this morning? Yo, ugh. Ugh. Yeah, that's uh, how you're that, feeling. I'm, I'm feel feeling it. that good right now. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm great, man. Fired up. Uh, again, like I said, it was great meeting Bradley yesterday. Yeah. And we're two weeks away from Ooh. Black Friday, which at, is real. at Live Bearded is the, you know, it's the biggest day of the year. It's a Super Bowl. So all hands on deck working our asses off. But uh, no, man, I'm excited. I feel good. I just finally officially booked all of my sh all of my stuff for Australia. So oh, I'm go let's go! I'm, I'm going to Ooh. Australia for two weeks. I've all got right. a bucket list trip planned. I've got Give some us amazing the high shit. level itinerary. You going? Are yeah. you, are you hitting up Lord of the Rings uh, locations? I think that's in New Zealand. That uh, it could be both. It's, it's definitely New Zealand. It's definitely New Zealand. It's close. Yeah. Uh, so L.A. to Sydney. Okay. I land at like 6 a.m. Yeah. I immediately like go jump on another flight and I fly to this place called Hamilton Island. Okay. Which is where the Great Barrier Reef access point is. So I got Great Barrier Reef, Whit Sunday Islands. I'm doing a helicopter tour of the Whit Sundays Sick. and the Great Barrier, yep. and they've built like this landing spot, like this little boat that has a helipad that is just docked at the Great Barrier Reef. So you can literally helicopter out to it, land, land on, on the it, boat, land on the boat, okay, and then you have like Some 90 James minutes. Bond shit, you know, yeah. you have like 90 <laughs> minutes to do, go uh, snorkeling, <laughs> diving, and to just hang out. Yeah. So I was looking for different, like, really cool excursions that I could do. Yep. I really wanted to do a seaplane. They have like the freaking planes that land on the water, yep. and they'll take you out to different spots on the reef, on the Great Barrier Reef, and they'll stop, and like you can get out and scuba dive and whatnot, but. I was very disappointed to find out that they don't offer it past COVID. 
They said, oh, up until COVID, we had to blah, 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 change some bullshit. COVID ruined so many yeah. things. So, so much. So I was sad, but they were like, we got this other thing. And basically, I can only land in the one spot, obviously. It's a fucking helicopter. But it's super fucking cool. Sick. I got that. I'm going to stay there for five days. It's like a small island. Only golf carts on the island. Oh, I love it. So I got a fucking, <laughs> they call them buggies. I don't know why. Buggy? They got a, every, every Airbnb listing was like, complimentary buggy, complimentary buggy. I'm like, like what, what the, the fuck, fuck is a buggy? Is a buggy? <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a cart that's pulled by a donk. <laughs> <laughs> They make it seem like there's a motor on it, but it's really just yeah. a dog. You're like, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know the most important part about being in a cart pulled by a donkey? What? To duck the shit that comes at you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's some projectile yeah. feces. But no, so <laughs> just, that's uh, I'm Violet, there for five Violet. days, and then I did some research and heard about this place called Noosa, which is like on the Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast. Okay. Heard it's amazing, so I'm staying there for seven days. Going to be there over Christmas. During the Christmas holiday, I figured I didn't want to travel too much, so I'm staying there for a week and then hitting Sydney for a few days and then jumping on a jet plane and flying back. There we go. Yeah, it'll be cool. You wanted to go for a while. You know, I mean, it's been on the list for a while, I feel like. It's really funny, man. I feel like this comes full circle because when I first started my business in 2011, right, I did some local travel. I went to Costa Rica. But then I have I had this vivid conversation that I remember with one of my buddies, Kevin. Um, it was like January 2012. I was literally staying at your fucking house in Arcadia. <laughs> and Kevin was in town, so we were grabbing lunch. And he's like, hey, man, where are you going to next? And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I'm not sure where I want to go. And he's like, you should go someplace that you've never been, someplace across the world, some places that pushes you outside of your comfort zone. I'm like, yeah, that Siberia. sounds great. And he's like, is there any place that you've wanted to go? And I was like, I've always wanted to go to Australia and Thailand. And he goes, you should go to Thailand because they don't speak the language. And I was like, okay, cool. And I went home, literally sitting at your table, at fucking the house in Arcadia, <laughs> And I bought a one-way ticket to Thailand. And that's when he landed in Samui? And that's when I went to Samui for the first wow, time. Wow, the very first time. Yeah, exactly. Wait, wow. Why one way? Because I didn't know when I was coming <laughs> Cause, back. Because he could. Because <laughs> okay. he could. I, could <laughs> I wanted to make it really hard for myself. <laughs> I didn't want to worry about the return <laughs> ticket. <laughs> no, it was great. And so that was literally like the biggest first international trip I ever took in 2012. Fast forward 11 years. And uh, I'm going to the other place yeah, on my list, option. which is Australia. Yeah. So, Super but cool. in between there, you know, like 40 countries and all the different crazy shenanigans along the way, it's been pretty exciting. So, that's my biggest update for the week. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's not like I have a kid coming or yeah. a, a fucking one year wedding anniversary or anything like that yeah. coming up. No. Nah. Yeah. No. Nah. I was building a nursery all weekend. <laughs> <you know? laughs> like my weekends now consist of the cribs built. Now we're like getting all prepped, and uh, I can't wait, man. It's a lot of it's it's a different use of time on the weekends to go through like the honeydew list and get get all the things prepped and ready. But it is coming fast. We got a baby boy coming January third. So yeah, I mean my big updates are that's hey, about that as big of an fast. update as yeah. you could possibly have. I, I feel like there's a very big lesson in here for all the brothers listening because you and I like I literally just talked about the very first like big trip I booked was yeah. from your living room or from your kitchen table. Yeah. Right. And then since then, we've went on trips all around the world together. You and I moved to Thailand together. We moved to Maui together. We moved to Colorado together as we were building Live Bearded. Yep. Right. And so for like a period of our life, when we were first friends, we were doing very different things, but we were homies. Then for a period of our life, we were literally doing the exact same thing, building the same yep. company. Right. And now, like our lives are kind of going in very different directions. One day, I hope to be married and have a kid, but like you're there. Right. Yeah. And so here I am talking about going to Australia <laughs> and doing this crazy bucket list trip. Right. And you're like building cribs like and doing like a house remodel having and having a one year anniversary coming <laughs> yeah. up in a few days. And it's like what's really cool about that is our friendships, our journeys, our experiences, the people that we have, like they're going to go in very different directions at times. But as long as we have the same values that mm -hmm. we live our life by, we're always even though like our directions might be different our growth is going to be similar or we're still going to have the ability to grow together, even though we're growing in different directions, yes. if that makes sense. And I think, you know, it's talked a lot about, they say the average man doesn't ha feel like he has one best friend because you get married, you have kids, you're getting yeah. pulled in different directions. You got to earn your income. You don't have time for friends anymore. Boom, boom, boom. All these things happen. And then you start to feel isolated or lonely or disconnected. And I think that we can stay connected. We just have to work at it right and we have to understand that that's also part of life and there'll be seasons that we're doing the honeydew list or the seasons that we're traveling or the seasons that we're raising kids or building business i think oftentimes the biggest problem we have is we think we shouldn't have them but just 
acknowledging the season that we're in, I think is a, a really powerful lesson. And yeah. it just, as you were talking about your journey and I just got talking, got done talking about mine. I was like, gosh, we could not be going <laughs> in like <laughs> different directions yeah. right now, yeah. but like, there's so much beauty in that. And there's well, so it's only a season of time, that. right? Like you're in the season now, but to your point, you said, you hope that it's not in this season forever. You find your partner, you can start a family potential, whatever. And so long as friends are growing together, they come back and overlap again. Right. Yeah. Cause I am just experiencing this, this now with the baby coming and the house remodel and being more grounded now than I've ever been. And I have friends like Jason who have gone literally since second grade and he's like one of my closest friends. We weren't super close for last or we weren't in terms of proximity and time because I was traveling more and gone and he was doing the family thing. And so we weren't sharing that chapter together. Now there's more overlap there. So it, the seasons come, they go, they change as long as you keep in contact, which is one of the questions we had. It, it's harder to stay in contact with, with, friends and people as yeah. life gets busy right yeah. but it takes a little good, more effort good segue into the yeah i mean question. i don't know if we're gonna touch on that but we got a few questions so i think let's let's team yeah. up gr yeah we looked uh we looked it up earlier one of the questions like you said uh it comes from Stu. what's up Stu? what's up Stu? Stu said Stu. you think that's s-t-u or s-t-e-w s-t-u for sure right yeah i mean hope so he Wait, can't trust the stew. Knows. People are getting weird with names. Speaking of getting names, naming oh. a baby is fucking hard. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know that Stu's on our list. No offense, Stu. It's a great name, but it's hard, you know? It's like well, his real name Stu Stewart. Okay, Stu oh, Work, okay. going okay. for Stu. So, okay. yeah. That makes sense. Anyways, a lot of pressure. People are getting weird with names out there these yeah. days. But Stu, <laughs> you got a great name. What does, what does Stu have to say? Yeah. <laughs> Stu's question is Hey, Beardsman. I've been struggling to find a work-life balance lately. What tips do you have for managing career ambitions while still being present for family and personal life? That is a good question I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I mean, that, maybe that's I, part of the answer. I think it's part of Yeah, for sure. I think it changes the different seasons of life that you're in. I think you're in a building stage when you're younger, single. You don't have a lot of commitments to family where you can go all in on business. I think naturally as priorities change, like I'm entering into this life now with my now wife, um, with a baby coming where I want to have all the drive of the business, but also still want to be a very intentional and present husband first and father second. And um, it gets a lot harder to do. My, my one thing that I keep going back to is just being absolutely relentless with how you spend your time, right? Because we, we all have the same amount of time in the day. But if I'm trying to drive the business and be fully in what we're building here with Live Bearded, when I get home, I still want to be fully in with my wife and just be that much more intentional and present with my time. Because I think if you're if you're intentional with your time, you can spend less amount of time to get more done, right? If you're not distracted in business, you put your head down for 60 or 90 minutes, you can accomplish three or four hours worth of work if you're having side conversations or distractions. And so for me, it's just, I've been trying to be intentional about uh, how I'm spending my time and just being ruthless with the efficiencies. Yeah. Um, for example, like a little thing that's helped with my, uh, my relationship with my, my wife is when I get home, 6.30, 6.45, we have dinner, the phone's down, do not disturb. I am 100% present at dinner for 60 minutes. We chat, we go deep, we go on a walk. So for about 90 minutes in the evening, we're just one-on-one -on -one time. And there's no thoughts of business. There's no thoughts of anything else. You can't reach me because my phone's literally just away. And I'm not looking at anything. I'm not checking emails. I'm not working on anything. Because when you try to do both, I feel like I've found that then you're losing on both sides. I'm not really fully present with my wife. I'm not really doing high quality work because it's it's half in, half out. And so a little trick that I've I've implemented that's had huge success for, for me is just uh, carving out that time of intentionality and then yeah. not being distracted or trying to be in two places at once. Yeah. Uh, I think all that's great advice. I, I, I've thought about this a lot, and I think I've come to the conclusion that's a little bit controversial, but I don't think balance exists. I think it's bullshit. And I don't know, if you have a scale that's balanced, it typically says zero. And I don't think anybody wants a life of zeros, right? Like, um, for me, exactly to what you said, it's about carving out or putting parameters around things that are must-haves and then being ruthless with the discipline to do that or to follow through. So I think, you know, anybody who's accomplished anything great, they didn't have any, quote, balance. Everything was skewed in one way. So if you think of balance as like 100%, right, of, of like 100% over here, 100% over here, like equal weighted. Right? I don't think anything will ever be equal weighted in our lives. Like, I think the areas that we want to improve the most on have to get disproportionate energy and attention. And that could be your business. That could be your health and wellness. That could be your relationship, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be business or money or drive. Like, it yeah. Can, yeah. But depending on what you're trying to optimize for, right? Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, you could, you could still use the word balance if you want because it's so, you know, like that's the vernacular, that's the language that everybody uses. But, like... We're, you know, if you want to build a great career, you're probably going to have to spend 
six, eight, 10, 12 hours a day mm -hmm. building that skill set. Okay. So that is just automatically gone. That if you're okay, we're going to sleep six hours a day, right? So now you got 18 hours left. Okay. You probably got four hours worth of miscellaneous bullshit in there from like eating, driving, doing different stuff, right? Yep. So that cuts you down to 14. And now, you know, you got 14 hours, let's say, the average person of allotted time. Okay, how do you want to invest that time? Do you want to, you, you're very intentional with investing, you know, a few hours every night uninterrupted with your wife. And that helps build the foundation of your relationship. Amazing, right? I don't know that you could have the same, like, I don't think you could have, if you have 12 hours, mm -hmm. Four hours with your wife, four hours with your health and fitness, four hours with yep. your job, and four hours over here, right? And that's like, conceptually, I think that's what people think about when they hear balance. That's how I think about it. Or I'm going to spend a third of my time here, a third of my time here, and a third of my time here. Yeah, when you break it down like that, I, I do agree because I think it's unrealistic to devote that many hours. And to me, when I think of balance, I don't think it has to be a one-to-one -one of four hours here, four yes. hours there. But that's where the intentionality of how you're spending your time, an hour of focus or 90 minutes of focus, dedicated, deep connection could be way more value than four hours of just hanging out watching Netflix, yes. right? And so being intentional with how you're spending your time, that gives you balance, uh, but not one-to-one -one in terms of an hour exchange. If yeah. That makes sense. yeah, and I think um, that's why I personally, like the word balance doesn't work for me. I like to use the word integration because I wanna integrate my business life with my personal life with my other aspects, right? Yeah. And so I want it to be integrated and then I want to intentionally decide, okay, I'm gonna allot X amount of hours to my career. I'm gonna allot X amount of time to my health and fitness. I'm gonna, I'm gonna allocate X amount of time to my relationships. And so I think the only way we ever quote, get balance in our life is by maybe approaching it more as integration or saying mm -hmm. balance for me is like two hours here in my health and fitness a day, eight hours over here in my job every day, and then four hours here with my wife and my yeah. kids and whatever. Like, I think the only way you ever get to it, whether you want to call it balance or integration or whatever fucking language you want to call it, it's just being intentional. Like you yeah. said, with for during this time, I'm going to be present here and this is all I'm going to do. Yeah. And I think that's the only way to get it. And then each individual man has to sit down and determine where, where, are, you, the, yeah. where are you investing your time? Because if you're saying yes to something, you're saying to no, no to something else. And I will say, as I've gotten older, you have to be ruthless with how you're spending your time because you can't fucking do it all. Not if you really want to be successful in these areas. And so like, if you want to drive and build a business, like you're going to have to commit eight, 10, 12 hours into that, but you don't want to lack in your relationship. So you have to find time for that. But that may mean you got to say no to going out to the bars on the weekends with your buddies. Yeah. Or you may need to say no to sleeping in on Saturdays and Sundays and getting up and having a productive, a productive day. Right. Yeah. And so you will have to say no to certain things, but you have to step back and say, what am I really trying to build? And then balance your investment of time yeah. into accomplish those things that you're trying yeah, to, and trying get to get. On, like, and communicate that. Right. Like I, I don't, I can't remember who said it, but I was listening to a video and they were, it was an entrepreneur and he was talking about with his wife and he's like, look, babe, Dude, so this true. is what I'm fucking creating. So true. This is the life that we want to build. This is the life that we this want. This is what it's going to take. And this is what it's going to take. And yeah. so that means I'm going to miss a lot of dinners. That means yeah. I'm going to be doing a lot of meetings. That means like for this next X period of time, like it's going to be a lot less time together because we're investing that today. We're sacrificing some time together for the payoff in the future. And so I think, so again, true. it just comes down to you making the decision of what balance looks like to you and redefining how you're going to spend your time and then discipline and focus and being ruth ruth uh, ruthless yeah. with it. Yeah. That was really good advice, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell we've yeah. thought a lot about this at this stage in our lives. Like, yeah, it sounds like there's been a lot of turmoil to help you guys determine <laughs> your own personal work-life balances. How do we get the most juice yeah. out of this squeeze? You yeah. Know? How we're investing our time. It's a big it's a big one. You gotta think through it though. Cause if you don't, then you get washed up in just the whirlwind of the day. Yeah. And then you're not getting the output. Yeah, it's a whole yeah. thing. There's yeah. two there's there's two things. One you said, I'm gonna repeat, which is every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And then another thing I remind myself is if I don't sacrifice for what I want, what I want becomes the sacrifice. And so you just have to make the decision of like, right. what are you willing to sacrifice? Do you wanna sacrifice what you want tomorrow or sacrifice Tomorrow, what you want tomorrow for today. Like it's, yeah. it's such an interesting balance though, because tomorrow's not guaranteed. And so there's that balance of enjoying the journey and not sacrificing everything today for the potential future tomorrow. Yeah. It's a fuck. it's a, 
It's a difficult fucking dance. This is a very deep philosophical <laughs> approach to it. I think Buddha said happiness comes from within. Oh, gosh, please don't quote me on it. I'm pretty sure that's right, though. But people should just do what makes them happy. Like you said, you, saying yes to one thing means saying no to another thing. And short of taking happiness away from other people, just focusing on the things that you want to accomplish mm -hmm. will ultimately lead to that happiness. But like you said, you got to invest and choose which ones you're going to balance on. Yeah. Well, I don't think we're going to solve all of life's problems here <laughs> no. today. Can't unpack it all, but ultimately <laughs> trial that was and error. Do. Trial and error. Hopefully that was I think helpful too. <laughs> probably got way He's more like, than these fucking guys for. just went yeah. up. <laughs> well, being a hundred percent involved in whatever it is you decide to do, yes. and then just knowing that like there isn't a perfect balance, it's always going to shift around. Yeah, and being so. Yeah, the integration. Sorry, I tried to yeah. boil it all. Yeah, down. no, that's <laughs> the recap. I think I got your thesis. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, our next question comes from Reggie. Reggie asked. In today's fast-paced world, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. Can you share some effective strategies for staying mentally resilient and managing stress? Mink, you want to kick it off? Yeah, I think just keeping this one simple. Like for me, it is understanding what I enjoy doing and then just doing that when I'm feeling overwhelmed or stressed out. Uh, you know, I work out damn near every day because that helps me manage my level of stress and overwhelm. I think just doing hard things makes hard things easier, yep. you know? Um, I literally just saw this thing today and it said, you know, the weights at the gym don't get easier to lift, you just get stronger. And I think that's how overwhelm is. Like you just get stronger at carrying it. Yep. Um, so I think that's number one is just like embracing it and, and growing through it. Um, and then just finding things that you love to do, you know? Like whether it's a good movie, spending time with your wife, a motorcycle ride, a workout. Yep. I think uh, the only way to manage it, and then also, I mean, oftentimes the meaning that we give things determines the experience we have of it. So I think a lot of times we turn, you know, molehills into mountains just because we embellish the importance of it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I try to remind myself as it relates to feeling overwhelmed is like, if it's not going to matter in a day, a week, a month, or a year, then it probably doesn't fucking matter at all. And I probably shouldn't allow this to steal too much of my happiness and peace today. Yeah, I think that's spot on. Yeah. So I would say finding things that you love to do that can help you feel refreshed or just change your pattern. Yep. And then managing the relationship you have to the things that are making you feel overwhelmed and putting things in perspective. Yep. Um, one of my favorite authors is Michael Singer. And he wrote this book called The Surrender Experiment. And he has a lecture series where he literally explains the entire creation of the universe. He spends an hour and he's like, there was these gases and they started swirling and then the big bang and boom. And then there was stardust throughout the gap. And he goes through this whole thing about like what a fucking white dwarf is and how a black hole is created. And literally an hour of like all this crazy astrological science-y shit. He's like, if you take a white dwarf, which is like a planet that has been like smashed down into the smallest like possible matter, it like breaks the atoms in together, and you take a teaspoon of it, it weighs like a hundred thousand tons because the matter is so dense. So dense. Right? Mm -hmm. And he talks about like the stars and the whole things. And at the end of it, he goes, The universe is 13.8 billion years in the making. That thing that's making you stressed out probably doesn't matter. <laughs> Who do you think? So, so good. Really put it into yeah. perspective. Oh, All right, yeah. Okay, yeah, I right. get it. I'm nothing. Yeah. The universe <laughs> has been occurring for 13 billion years. Who do you think you are to influence yeah. the moment before or the moment after you? You know, it's like, wow, we're all made of stardust, like yeah. legit stardust. Tiny little speck. Like, and also 13.8 billion years, and like you're gonna live a hundred. Like, you're not even a speck not on a fucking. Yeah. yeah. I think you're going to send people into an existential crisis yeah. right yeah. now. It's so true. It's such, but yeah. it's like the things that are overwhelming you, you know, they probably aren't going to matter too much tomorrow yeah. or in a month or in a year. Yeah. And I think that is the number one way that I've learned how to deal with overwhelm is putting things into perspective. And then I actually reverse the order. It's like I try to put them into perspective first and then I go do something that I enjoy because that like gives me separation from it. And then I go do something that I enjoy, yep. like dominate someone on the basketball court, <laughs> fucking hit buckets in their face, and then I feel good. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's spot on. I think uh, I agree with everything he said, not to, to be too redundant on it. For me, I think focusing on what you can control and just trying to have faith in the outcome of anything you can't control, that it's going to work out the way that it's intended and not get caught up in the shit that you have literally no control over. But if you can do that, and then for me, if it's just, yeah, moving the body. If I can move the body, get a sweat, clear my mind, it's amazing how much clearer I can think 
uh, how much more energy I have. Happiness, joy just brings energy to my body and clears my mind. So yeah. I say get active, get in the gym, get out and hike. What do you do, JR? To manage stress. Overwhelm, yeah. Overwhelm. Um, I put on blinders and I push through it. <laughs> So I don't I don't know if that's healthy. It works for me though. Yeah. yeah. But like you said, like the weights at gyms don't. Uh, five hundred pounds get is five hundred pounds. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't get lighter. It just gets easier for you to lift. Yeah. But I mean, I kind of think of like Kobe when he would practice basketball. Like he he talked about how he did twice the amount of work of everyone around him, and you know that added up over a little bit. Or let's say a basketball player practices one hundred and fifty days of the year. And they practice two hours a day for those, you know, they get 300 hours of practice time. Kobe did double that. So he would be 300 hours, or he would be uh, 600. 600 hours mm -hmm. when everyone was just 300. And then he did that the next year, and he did the next year. Compound and yeah. compounding. And compound. this compounding interest that mm -hmm. built up, it put him years and leagues ahead of everyone in his yeah. class and everything. So, I mean, I kind of look at it that way. Like, I just push through and I do the really hard things because I know when I come back to it, eventually the blinders are just there and it's just kind of like this blind focus of yeah. like i can push through this no problem i just need to do that yeah it's interesting you know i think uh two things come to mind you brought up the kobe analogy and it made me think of basketball and uh you know two things in basketball i remember we would do practices where the defense would have six or seven players and the idea was to and like offense had to yeah. overcome yeah. that yeah oh that would yeah suck. and so you, you literally make it way more difficult on you in practice, and five seems easy. So then, when you go into reality, <laughs> yeah, you know, it was like, and yeah. this is a similar concept of what yeah. you're talking about, right? It's like, actually, how do you like deal with overwhelm? Well, just like embrace yourself in it, so that you grow through it. Um, I remember I used to get Slam magazine, man. I had <laughs> basketball all over my wall. Wait, what was Slam magazine? It was just like a basketball, like basketball magazine. magazine yeah. Oh, Slam. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like Slam, you know. Slam. Like a Sports like, Illustrated, like, yeah, but just but basketball. For basketball. Oh, I got gotcha. you. And uh, they had this ad in there for this thing that you would attach onto the hoop, which made the hoop smaller. smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. And so it was like literally the size of the hoop would go from being the normal size to like just an inch bigger than the basketball. So, so you have to be spot on. Yeah. yeah, and so I got my mom to buy me one of those. And I just would shoot and shoot and shoot, you know, and I'm freaking 37 years old now, and, like, I can touch basketball and hit most shots just because of the years of repetition of overwhelming or making it more difficult on myself um, than, actual it is, and than it actually is in reality. So as much as we want to understand and have a positive relationship with overwhelm and not let it weigh us down – Actually embracing it and intentionally overwhelming ourselves is a great way to make us stronger, better, faster, more capable. When we're living in a time where it's like mental health and wellness and you want to like almost let off the throttle to take care of your self-care and not to discredit the value of self-care, self but I think we sometimes undervalue the resiliency that we have in, inside of us to push the limits and go further and go faster. And it, oftentimes I think it's, it's uh, yeah, I think to that point, it's like if you make it harder on yourself – and build up the resiliency, that weight becomes just normal. Playing against seven guys becomes easier, um, and yeah. you just raise your level of, of yeah. ability to tackle it. Yeah, I mean, when when uh, when I started my first business, making a $100 decision was, like, intense. It was stressful, <laughs> right? And then we had to make a $1,000 yeah. we we $1, decision. And it was like, fuck, dude, $1,000? Like, yeah. I don't even have that in my bank account right now. How am I going to do this? And then we make $10,000 decisions. And then with Live Beer, do we make hundred thousand dollar decisions and now we make million dollar decisions and it's like no big deal yeah and like a hundred dollars used to stress me the fuck out i never imagined i would make a million dollar decisions and now we we do that every day to some degree and it only comes by like embracing getting the overwhelm yeah. and getting the overwhelm and, and working through it so yes we want to figure out how to have a healthy relationship with it but we also want to use it yeah i think to what you said adding perspective to the stress and like the grand scheme of things uh gives it a healthy perspective on it like it's healthy healthy dose of, healthy of, dose of stress yeah. healthy yeah. dose of reality and then you can work through it yeah, yeah. it's a great question that. yeah solid yeah. last question comes from eli eli asked in a culture that often emphasizes immediate gratification how can we teach patience and resilience to the younger generations Ooh, Mr. that's a good one soon to be dad <laughs> dude so i had this thought the other recently actually about all right i got a baby boy coming into the world 
And of course, I'm naturally going to want to take care of him and give him what he need, meet his needs, exceed his needs. But how do you not raise a spoiled little fucker who's just got every little toy, every little thing, and teach some of that delayed gratification, right? And like make him think you're really poor. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. I feel like I feel like in the world we live in today, with social media, with everything, it's like the easy button, self gratification. They want it now. Nobody wants to put in the work. And yeah, how do we build that resiliency and instill that into our younger generation? It's been top of mind for me, and it's like borderline stressing me out a little bit because it's like I want to raise this, raise this kid obviously with standards and values, and I'm confident that we're going to do our best to do that. Um, but you also want to give and 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 provide for them. So that balance has been a thought that's come up in my head, uh, yeah, more recently. So what have you come? What conclusion have you come up? with? I haven't come up with it yet. Yeah, <laughs> this question's it's timely because I'm like I'm yeah. here to, I'm here to answer it. Yeah. Um, I so there was something that my dad did with me back in the day, and he did it to like teach me work at the time it just made me like really upset because yeah. it was at, at the time i was like this is such a waste of time this is dumb um so my mom grew up in a small town in like east of tucson called wilcox it's like a ghost town now <laughs> there's still people there but my grandpa had a farm out there and my dad sent me out there for the summer just to do like the most gruntiest of grunt work yeah. on that farm and it was awful yeah. he did it to teach me hard work and yeah. everything and out there in the sun of arizona all summer just like i learned how to drive stick shift from that out there so that was good even though no one drives stick shift anymore but it did teach me this perspective of just like this hard work of just like like i said putting those blinders on and just focusing and doing it through it because there was one thing it was like 300 feet of this concrete ditch that they used to like irrigate farms and it was like just filled with mud and dirt and he wanted it gone so I dug out the dirt through the whole trench and then broke the concrete. Yeah. And then we drove this tractor. I'd pick up the chunks of concrete, throw it in the bucket, drive the tractor, dump it in this like dumpster thing, and then come back and just do that for like 300 feet. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that pretty bull. pretty significantly. When I was growing up, my uh, pops always put me to work. So I, I had to earn my money, didn't just get an allowance, had to mow lo the lawn, of course, do the house chores. But I remember running a tractor and digging out fence posts. I remember picking up trash from construction sites and he would always, he did a phenomenal job of, of helping me as like a little 10, 11, 12 year old finding jobs to do, but he would drop me off, come pick me up at the end of the day and like literally make me go earn the money that I was, that I was getting. And that definitely instilled a, a sense of work ethic in myself that- Do you uh, remember that feeling though, of like after you were to like dig out that fence post or like, was there ever a time when you looked at like this huge daunting task of even landscaping kind of deal? You looked at the completed thing. You're like, damn, I did that whole thing. Yeah, feel accomplished. Yeah. You feel amazing. You feel so accomplished when you I get think finished that with was, it. Yeah, that was the, the sense of the yeah. biggest feeling I remember yeah. taking away from yeah. it. I think a belief is a shitty substitute for an experience. What you guys are just talking about right now is experiences yeah. that taught you something. 100%. You know, um, have you guys ever heard of the marshmallow test? Oh, is that the, uh, the patience? One yeah, patience yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, you can Google it, and there's, like, videos. It's fucking hilarious to watch, actually. So I highly recommend you just go to YouTube and type in Marshmallow Test. But the premise is this. They put a young kid, 8, 10 years old, whatever it is. Maybe he's even younger. Maybe 6, 8, whatever. But a young, a young kid in a room by himself. There's nothing in the room. And you come in, and you say, okay, here's a marshmallow. And you can eat this now if you want. Or if you wait 10 minutes, I'll come back, and I'll bring you two. And there's like these videos of them. The kids like pick it up. They'll like look yeah. at it. They'll like lick it, put it back down. Like some people just fucking mouth it down right yeah. away. Like they don't even like. care, right? And what's really interesting is they've directly linked delayed gratification to achievement. Mm -hmm. And the longer that you can delay gratification, the greater likelihood of success and achievement in other areas of your life. Um, which is scary to think about what that means for today. Because today, are for everybody wants instant gratification. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we've talked about this before. All of my biggest mistakes, like if we just think about in business or in finance, like all of my biggest financial mistakes have come because I was trying to get instant return, instant gratification, short term results, whether it was like a business decision that I made, a finance, an investing decision, and then even to some degree in life, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, if I look back at all of the times that I paid a really large dumb tax, I was trying to get immediate results or, or quick results. Um, so, yeah, how do you get away from that? I think the first thing you do is understand that it's there and it's pervasive. Mm -hmm. You know, and I notice myself even 
like I'll be training myself to like be patient, but then in another area of my life, things come easy and then it kind of perverts the patience that I'm creating mm -hmm. because I'm getting it. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. it's, I think now more, more than ever, it's just a balancing act. Um, but I think if, if you were to say, how do you create patience in someone? What would you do? Well, you would make sure they don't get things very quickly. Mm -hmm. You would make them work for it. You would make them have to overcome obstacles to get it. And I think that we can, we can do that in our own lives and we can surely do it as fathers. For sure. Um, but we just have to have a, the willingness to the, like push it, push the experience out or work for it and then hold our yeah. son's daughters accountable to it. Starting with the awareness. I think that's yeah. spot on. It's funny. You mentioned the marshmallow test and I, uh, I have a pretty awesome memory. I think I shared it with you previously. Uh, and my dad essentially gave me the marshmallow test with finances without knowing about the marshmallow test. Oh, yeah. But it was one of the, I mean, it's a core memory I have. I was like six years old and we go down to the bank and he's like, all right, Spence, we're going to open up a savings account. And I literally have the deposit book still to this day. It was bank one before Chase bought him up. <laughs> and they have my little chicken scratch, six-year-old handwriting. And I deposited like six bucks into my first checking savings account. He, of course, was on the account because I was six years old or whatever. But <laughs> $6. And what his rule was for that short period of time was that if you save this money, if you earn this, first I had to go earn the money through chores or through lawn or whatever. But if you go to the bank and you save it, I will match that $6. And so your six will turn into 12. And he did that to instill delayed gratification of if you invest and save your money, it will grow versus going and spending that $6 on some fucking Skittles or something. Right. And so I have a checkbook since I was six to like 12 years old with my chicken scratch growing six dollars, four dollar deposit, two dollar deposit, twelve dollar deposit. And they got a little bigger. I work jobs and start saving. And and that was his way to match my money. I saved up enough money to buy buy my car, uh, which is my 1969 Camaro that I still have today. And it was just an amazing lesson that he kind of shared with me to uh, just display that if you have the discipline of delaying buying those toys and investing, that will grow into a much bigger reward, i.e., yeah. Muscle car, you know yeah. what I mean? Super Two cool. marshmallows. Two yeah. marshmallows. <laughs> yeah, so I think if we distill down everything that we've said here, the way to do it is to design an experience that requires inputs before outputs, mm -hmm. right? It's that's I love that. I mean, I never had anything like that, yeah. and that's incredible. Fucking cool. Um, I love that. And, and it know, is a muscle, and I do think it's like it's interesting, like how did, does that overlap in different areas of your life? Because if you can build the discipline of delayed gratification and inputs without expectation of yeah. outputs longer yeah. time horizon like how does that impact your relationships how does that impact your business how does that impact i mean yeah. all areas of your life and i'm right? trying to think of an, a practical example i have two stupid ones that come up right it's like uh let's say that you want to have a extra beer at night you yeah. want to have a slice of cake you want to have whatever food that you're craving in that moment it's like well go run a mile and then give it to yourself stupid example right yeah. but like you have a desire for something Put an obstacle in front of you, we'll go through that obstacle, and then reward yourself with that, right? Um, another example, like you want a new car, okay? Well, create a roadmap that says I have to do A, B, C, and D, and I have to get my income or my savings or my credit card debt or all these things mm -hmm. paid off. And once I get to this point, I'm gonna reward myself with that thing. Yep. And I think that's a way as adults we can we can tangibly do it. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm developing an affinity for watches. I, I like nice watches. Never had it before in my life, but like we bought ourselves one when we yep. hit a big milestone. Yep. That's a good example of Super something cool that celebratory. We, did. we earned it. We, we said, a goal. Spence and I said, okay, once we hit X amount of income in a particular month, we're going to treat ourselves. It was a very big milestone, very big goal. It took us seven years to hit it, six years to hit it. And after six years, we hit that goal and we went and we bought ourselves a very nice celebratory gift. Right. That's a term. That's an example of delayed gratification. Yeah. And now I'm like, damn, I want another one. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so I was we'll hit another milestone. <laughs> I was I was literally like looking at watches not too long ago and it was expensive. And I was like, you really should not do that right now. And I was like, OK, what goal or yeah. milestone? What thing can I put in my path that once I get through that, I can celebrate by doing this? And I think it's one of the ways that we can give ourselves kind of the carrot and the stick. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, this is what I really want. I want to go to Australia. I want to do these things. I want to have this experience. 
how can I make it even even more meaningful yeah. or or uh, be more intentional with it rather than just like giving myself the instant gratification and going and well, getting it? It becomes way more valuable to you because you're tying it to a memory or a goal or a sense of accomplishment, right? It's not like impulse. I'm going to go buy this and feel regret because maybe I spent too much money that I shouldn't have. But Simultaneously, you're, you're improving yourself too. Yeah. Yeah. What's well, it, It's interesting. Actually talking this out, like this is what I do in my life, like pretty religiously. Mm -hmm. Um with my new car that I bought recently, it was like, okay, once I get to this point in savings and situation and income, like I'll reward myself with with yeah. a new car. Yeah. And I did. And then I celebrated the fuck out of it. And I yeah. did not have a Guilt ounce free. Guilt of free. buyer's yeah. remorse because yeah. I put in the work required. So um, when I want the fucking extra cheesecake at night, I just go run a couple extra miles. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think it's spot on. Yeah. I think it takes a little more than a couple extra miles, though, to work off the calories of a cheesecake. Dude, cheesecake is dense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think lifting would equal more <laughs> of the cheesecake than. <laughs> um, yeah, those are all the questions from the community dude, those are great. that we have. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On to our do better dude. Yeah, do better. We? we love this segment, guys. If you're tuning in and you're not familiar, our do better dude of the week is really just us digging into the inter interwebs, finding and highlighting a man who's doing good shit in the world. Because let's be honest, when you scroll through social media or the news, it's probably some negative topic and we want to highlight men that are doing good in the world so we find them talk about them highlight them and thank them for what what they're doing so what do we got today jr yeah today okay okay september 10th 2022 at the bearing mountain in the washington cascade range Ooh, matt is, bishop this is dramatic <laughs> and steve cooper our friends steve cooper. matt and steve matt they steve. uh frequently went hiking during the pandemic and on this date, they went hiking just to get away, get out in nature. This is a story of overcoming odds and the story of a boy being resilient. <laughs> <laughs> this is the story of a girl who cried a no. The whole world. <laughs> Back to the story. Anyways, they're hiking, and right. as they hike, they're uh, summiting. They see some smoke off in the distance, but you know they don't really think of it. They think it's like from really far away, nothing near them. And as they get to the top of the peak, they see that there's a forest fire going on, like right in front of them. <laughs> they hiked to the forest fire. They hiked to the forest <laughs> fire. Not quite. Like they're looking down. And there's videos of it on YouTube. All I'll right. put the link in so you guys can watch it. But they get up to the mountain. They see the fire. And he calls his wife because there's like barely, there's a little pocket of reception. She's like, hey, there, there's a fire. We're going to turn around and come back home. And so she's, like, automatically worried already. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> which I thought was like, what a, what a dumb time to call Why your wife. Why you call your wife? <laughs> uh, but uh, so he turns around, and the fire is coming around. And as they're going back down the mountain, the mountain, the way it's shaped is uh, there's kind of like a canyon where there's not a lot of trees growing inside there. So the fire's on one side, and then down at the bottom, there's more fire coming up. So they get pinched between in the canyon <laughs> yeah in the canyon <laughs> now the fire's not gonna like consume them because there's no trees around them okay so they're just like really buried in smoke right now uh they realize that they're in trouble so he gets on his phone again they find another pocket of reception and they call search and rescue and they say hey we're trapped on the mountain and as they talk to him they're like we can't send a helicopter the winds are too dangerous you guys are on your own oh damn <laughs> so these Friend hikers are stuck in the mountain. There's fire coming on both sides, and they just start using their GPS because they can't they can't see where they're going, and they can't really follow the trail, so they're using their GPS to try and figure out the safest route down. So they start to go down the mountain, and you know they're trying to stay away from all the trees because at any moment the fire Wind can... Wind shifts and it yeah. engulfs you. Yeah, so they're like, fire. okay, we think we can make it, so they start going down. And they go a wrong direction. They come to, like, a 200-foot cliff. And, like, it's just them. Like, they don't have rope. They're not rock climbers. You're hiking. So they're not going to scale down a 200-foot cliff. So they have to backtrack a little bit, which makes the fire catch up to them faster. And so at that point, they kind of shift down. One of them almost falls off oh, the cliff. And, like, there's footage of these guys, like, were they now, documenting he, this process? Yeah, sure, which, yeah. Was the, which was really strange. But I imagine they're doing it just for, like, posterity because in your mind like if you die it's yeah, like this, this is the last is thing it. i can send people but you know they're like trying to be hopeful as they're just like recording themselves talking and coming down but you see all the smoke around them like you can't see anything and yeah. their masks are up they're trying to like breathe they can't do it 
Uh, they start making their way down, and they get a phone call, or they find another call because they're in an open area now, and they think maybe a helicopter can come and get them. Um, so he gets on the phone, but 911 emergency, it doesn't go to the right county. It goes to another <laughs> county, which, <laughs> whoops, I, yeah. So they lose like 30 minutes of time of just like, sorry, we're we're not the ones helping you, and like the fire shifted. 911 said sorry. <laughs> yeah, it sorry, was the, wrong county. It, it was hey, the hey, wrong dispatch. Just out of curiosity. What number do you call to get the right 911? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought there's only one. Right? <laughs> so apparently it gets diverted, though, if you're, like, at a different thing and whatever it was. they're all out in the sticks, right? Yeah. So it-, so it got sent to the wrong county, and so they tried to redirect them to connect. Like, they didn't just say, like, hey, yeah, yeah, of course, y- you're of course. screwed. <laughs> but it delayed this reaction. They couldn't get the helicopter out there. Like, the helicopter, like, tried to make it, but Dang. it was, like, a half mile away, and they still couldn't do it. So they're still sitting there. Surrounded by smoke on the mountain. And now they're like kind of in the trees. So like they could be consumed. Toast. <laughs> yeah. Burnt, toast, burnt toast. For lack of a better term. Uh, obviously they made it, but because <laughs> we're talking about it. But uh, as the flames are coming around, they still work their way down the mountain. And just through this like periodic and just just forcing yourself to do these really difficult things. They're climbing down rock slides. Um, you, you go hiking a lot. Yeah. How difficult is 1,400 feet in three-quarter miles. like 1,400 foot elevation? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty steep. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty steep, depending on the texture. Back. Camel Back's like 1,100 feet in a mile and a quarter, so yeah. a little steeper than that. Yeah. Quite a bit. Yeah, quite a bit steeper. Yeah. So it's probably it's probably pretty good grade. Yeah, that, that's slippery. what they're climbing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what they climbed up, and this is what they're climbing down right now. Climbing down is like, in my opinion, like that's, that's almost scarier because yeah. one trip and then like you're going <laughs> – you're going pretty far. Uh, but anyways, they found some more cliffs and stuff, and they had to, like, climb down some trees, shimmy down, and they ended up making it back to the parking lot with their car. What? They the were same the, parking lot? Same parking lot. They found their way back using GPS and just kind of knowing the trails and everything, and they got back to their car. They were the only car in the parking lot. They let <laughs> everyone... They evacuated everyone else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they let everyone else know that, like, you know... We we made it, and it was twelve hours that they were gone. Twelve hours. So they left. They got there about seven in the morning, and I looked at the distance from like the county where his wife was at, where they said, um, and it's about like an hour drive. So they left at six. They got home at six. So about twelve hours altogether of just the like almost dying. Damn. But they stuck to it. <laughs> you know, in, in that situation, what do you do? Do you do you Sit it out, hope yeah. for the best. You record your last message to your family and just wait there to die, or do you? They move took forward? action and it figured it out. Right? Yeah, yeah. Even and even though that they weren't sure about what was going to happen, they're like this is this is the only thing we can do. Instead of sitting and waiting for help, yeah. they went out and <laughs> they they saved themselves. Yeah, that's a wild. Story. Giving everyone else a heart attack in the meantime, but like they. Do you did. say they had masks? Is this during COVID? Uh, yeah. So it was during so they COVID. They masks? didn't have masks. They just took their okay. shirts and say, okay. tried to like. Yeah, because the smoke. I mean, the inhalation of the smoke could. Yeah. Like, totally when you look at the videos, you can see that their eyes are like pretty red too. Like it's there's so much irritant in oh, the God. air, and already like being that high with an elevation, like you know how easy is it to breathe up yeah. there? It's Plus probably the even worse. Yeah. Well, shout out to these guys for being badasses. They probably both had beards, I would assume, because they survived and <laughs> navigated their way down. <laughs> now they grow beards. <laughs> like, I'm a man. <laughs> now, nah, I mean, it's super cool. Wild story. Uh, good on them for just problem solving and figuring it out. Because in that moment, it's like, well, what the fuck do you do? Do you wait it out? Do you sit on this? You know what I mean? Like, now you take action and yeah. you just yeah. put your life in your own hands and figure it out. In so many ways, it's like a, uh, a, a one-day metaphor for all of life. You know, like the shit's going to hit you. There's going to be fear and doubt and you're not sure if you're going to make it and you don't know what road you're going to go down. And there's a try over here. No, fuck. That's a cliff. Okay, pivot. Try over here. All right. Yeah. It's like, but if you just keep going, if you don't let it overwhelm you or stress you out, you just keep moving forward little by little, not knowing where you're going to go, if it's the right decision or the wrong one. um, Inevitably, you make it off the mountain. Um, Yeah. really, Really cool story. Yeah. And they were generally going in the right direction because there's only one way off the mountain, and that's that's down. Yeah. <laughs> so how many different down ways yeah. can you find? <laughs> that's super. As cool. long as you're going this way, I think you're going to make it. Right. <laughs> Just pushing through. That's awesome. Yeah. There's our do better dude. Good job, Matt Bishop and Steve Cooper. 
Matt and Steve. Matt and Steve. A couple of good old Salute. boys. Yeah. Uh, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. And if you have questions that you want to submit, be sure to send them to ask at livebearded.com. That's an email. Or you can put your questions in the comments below. We'll accept that as well. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out with us today, guys. I think the, the greatest gift that you can give us is the gift of your attention and your time. And as we said in the beginning, we, we love doing this show just to hang out with you guys, answer your questions, chop it up, and talk about the crazy experience of being a man today. Um, if you have any questions, like JR said, send them to us. Uh, but as always, live bearded! Mic drop.